So please join me in welcoming Yeshua Close and Michael Ely. Good evening. Hello. We start with the disclaimer that I am not an art journalist. <laughs> What's up, man? What's going on, brother? Um, it's good to see you. It's really good to see you. Um, from the moment we met, I never anticipated doing something like this. So, right. you know, um, let's, see, let's see where it goes. <laughs> let's see where it goes. Um, one of the things, uh, just to kind of break the ice and, and, and get into like this, the origin story, is like, if you woke up tomorrow and you didn't feel like doing any work, what would you do? Like if you're like, I'm not doing any work today, so this is what I'm gonna go do. What, what would you go do? I'm sleeping. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I love that question though, um, because I think that with people who are so into what they do on a daily basis, in, in, my, in my case, obviously that's creating, it's very hard to imagine an alternative scenario where I wouldn't be in position to create. Um, and in fact, I do try to sleep sometimes, mm -hmm. but I end up waking up and um, engaging my creativity, if not actively, then sometimes it's through research or um, through, you know, sort of curiosities. It could be just light, lightweight sketching ideas or note making. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sorry to sound like that's all I do, but there are, there are weekends where that's my break, is yeah. kind of like uh, poking at, at work and not sort of 100% committing to accepting that I'm working that day, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. If anybody's ever, I, I've been blessed to do like a studio visit with Yeshua, and when you do a studio visit, you, you understand immediately how labor intensive the work, what's up, dude? You understand how um, labor intensive the work is um, that he's doing. And so, like, that's why, that's why I wanted to ask the question because, you know, like, if you were, uh, you know, I have broken bread together, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's different, but it's like, you know, I've always wondered, I remember asking, I remember asking my wife, I was like, I wonder if he just, like, goes out and shoots hoop every now and again, you know what I mean? Like, would you, you know, what would you do to just kind of clear your mind? Or do you, like, in the sense of, like, writers getting, like, writer's block, as, a, as an artist of your, your caliber, do you ever get stuck in need? What would you do to kind of break that? Mm -hmm. uh, besides sleep, besides sleep. <laughs> I don't get I don't get uh, creative blocks, but okay. <clears throat> um, but I do recognize, um, and, and this is also why I think, it, for me, and during this activation, I mentioned that that breathing part was felt very uh, therapeutic for me mm -hmm. because I do recognize that. Uh, there's a certain routine or discipline I, I think is helpful for me to, to bring into my life where uh, I have to place myself outside of work and that could be something uh, as simple as c going into quietude, meditation, breathing. Um, it's, it's funny that you know you say shoot hoops. I, I suck at basketball. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really. That's not my thing. Right, right. Um, but I do find that physical exertion also clears my head. Right. Uh, so I have sort of reluctantly become a runner in the past few years, and mm -hmm. um, especially during COVID, I got out there yeah. when there wasn't uh, many places to go to. Yeah. And and that would kind of help me clear my head and shake off uh, some of that sort of pent up frustration I'm sure we were all kind of sorting through uh, during that, that quarantine time for sure. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Wow, yeah. Um, okay. Um, I gotta ask you the same thing now, right? What's that? 
I mean, we here, you know, like you guys got to understand, we know each other. So we're, this is, it's weird asking questions, you know, the answer to sometimes. Um, what was the last moment that you can remember, whether it happened yesterday, today, last week, what was the last moment that you experienced where you found inspiration to work on something? Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. So this is a this is an interesting question and I find that uh, this is sort of a common question for creatives, right? It's like what inspires you and what's wh when were you sort of hit by a lightning bolt, right? The last time. And and I always answer the question honestly, okay. but then I but first I debunk it. Okay. So the, the one thing I, I kind of want to debunk is I think there is s sort of a myth about the, the creative person that the creative person is sort of that lightning rod waiting for, the, for a moment to strike where there's, you're sort of thrown into uh, or compelled to get up and get in front of your easel or whatever that is and start creating. Um, that happens at times, but it's actually rare, I think, for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. um, often I'm uh, inspired by coffee. Okay. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I I say that because you know I come from a from a very working class background, a working class attitude about uh, the studio practice, mm -hmm. um, where whether I feel it or not, mm -hmm. I put myself in the in the seat. Uh, in order to generate some momentum and be open towards that lightning bolt should it occur. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it doesn't occur, I'm still at work and mm -hmm. I'm, still, I'm still finding a way to uh, explore my, my curiosities. Mm -hmm. So now that I've done all that, now I've taken that route and now I'll answer the question uh, honestly. The last time I think I felt sort of really thrown into, I have to make this thing right now, this particular uh, thing. Um, that was a, a text-based piece. It was my first text-based piece that I've made. Uh, and I, I, got, I got the sense that I had been sort of repressing wanting to engage in press uh, text-based work for a while. There are so many brilliant text-based artists uh, in that space. And I think I was avoiding, actually, that's it right there. Um, I think I was avoiding dealing with that, contending with that history that mm -hmm. was already um, behind me. But the idea that I had made so much sense, usually if it's a new idea for me, it has to kind of make sense historically. It has to be very personal mm -hmm. uh, in order for me to feel like I have access uh, t to, to engaging that history. And that, that piece was those things and then also uh, material wise, it was a challenge that excited me to make uh, woodblock prints on that scale that were uh, printed directly on muslin cloth um, so they would function sort of as banners or drapery and there was some collage elements as well. It was all a little bit too complicated that I had to see it through. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the challenge of it compelled me to, uh, to, to try to make it happen so that I could see if this was possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the discipline that you spoke of early in the answer in terms of your, your blue collar background and stuff like that, how does that, um, how does that, in your opinion, really manifest itself in the, the work itself? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So woodblock printing is the kind of mainstay of my work. Mm -hmm. And it's physical because it, it involves carving large blocks of wood. Now I, I use a wood that, I'm gonna get a little art nerdy here, okay? It's MDF wood, so it's not 
uh, it's not real wood in the sense that it has a wood grain, uh, so I can carve into it in any direction. So that makes it uh, maybe a little bit easier, but then it also offers me so many more possibilities because I can uh, really carve it any way I need to. So um, it's a physical and kinetic uh, action. And uh, there are times where it's exhausting, it's physically exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as I've gotten older, I've learned to, to take breaks and chill out. But um, the, the blue collar thing might kick in sometimes because there's, I've always, I've always, I always remember my mother being proud of me for having a job when I was 13 years old, which I think is too young legally to work yeah. in the States. Um, but that, <laughs> that kind of a sense of pride that she had about me working, I think is something that pushes me uh, to create in the studio kind of around the clock mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, I guess origin story time. Um, <laughs> We met, and we were just catching up about that. Uh, we met through uh, an art advisor out of New York, Cheryl, and uh, mm -hmm. she introduced uh, me to your, to your work. My wife had already seen your work, and I remember yep, getting upset too. with my wife because <laughs> she hadn't showed it to me, which I didn't understand. So uh, <laughs> the first thing that I remember feeling when I saw your work was, and I don't know if we ever talked about this, but it just, I don't see anyone else doing it. I don't think you're being copied in any way. <laughs> and I just feel like you definitely stand out. Your work is very unique. Um, it, it speaks to all kinds of issues of, of masculinity, which um, I think we're kind of at a, an interesting time in trying to define what that is right now. Um, so what do you think, what was, here's a better question, were you ever just doing like portraits and figurative stuff prior to this beautiful work that is being showcased up here? What were you like just doing straight portraits before ever? Oh yeah, and again, um, this, my trajectory as an artist, I, I like to use the word stumbling forward. Mm -hmm. Because I'm from uh, this working class background, um, I didn't have creatives in the family directly and I didn't know from the outset, what it would mean to be a professional artist, or even if that was a possibility. That mm -hmm. didn't seem to be something on the radar. So I began like, uh, I think a lot of kids in that, in that situation, I was drawing, my, my first love was drawing. I would copy comic books. Mm -hmm. um, and my arrival at the techniques I'm using now, with block printing primarily, and then of course collage, came through drawing. For me, woodblock printing seemed like another way to do a drawn line. It was more committed because I was carving that line out of wood. There was no erasing it. Mm -hmm. um, but it seemed like a natural translation of the kind of like muscle memory I was already doing. Mm -hmm. I had built so many years doing mm -hmm. uh, as a drawer. I had tried my hand at painting for a while, but um, the paintings looked good, but I didn't enjoy the process. Mm. Um, and, and I did get some attention for the paintings and a lot of encouragement mm -hmm. to continue with them. Um, but I didn't enjoy the process because I the, the technique I was using didn't allow me to, to discover along the way. I had sort of predetermined an image, and I was it was just a matter of time before arriving at the image. Mm -hmm. So. Woodblock printing allowed me, uh, the way that I'm using it, allowed me a lot more sort of experimentation and flexibility. And to your point, I was trying to discover something that I felt um, ownership of and that I hadn't seen before. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that for me was the, the biggest challenge, finding a way to make images that reminded me of things I had seen in history, but was adding on to, hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, without repeating. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it always strikes me, you know, whenever I see your work, just like I said, how original it is, how you're running your own mm -hmm. race. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I think in the art world you see, especially as a collector, you see people who are, are very, very similar. In, in certain ways, and, and um, that is not the case with you. Um, what, what do you think, like, will you potentially change direction anytime soon? I think I've, I know I asked you this before, yeah, actually, yeah, I asked yeah. you this last year, I think I asked you. Do you remember what I said? I don't. I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. So, uh, man, my answer for this is too easy. It's no. There you go. Yeah. Well, so when I did uh, my thesis show, when I graduated Hunter College, I, it was my first woodblock print based collage making I had done. Mm -hmm. And I remember hanging it up in my, in, the, in my thesis room that I was assigned and the other MFA students looked at the work, they admired it, for the most part, and then they would say to me, okay, now that you did that, now what's next? And I thought, this is a whole alphabet in front of me, right? I felt like I had broken into a new language that I could see myself mining for years. Um, so what I didn't expect, though, is that I'd still be here today mining this language mm -hmm. and it's easy for me to say uh, no I don't think I'll, I'll stop it because it it does feel to me like every every piece that I make encourages the next one I'm sort of left with new questions after I complete a piece and those questions compel me to to chase them down in the next one mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very grateful for that I mean it feels as though there's sort of uh, a constantly evolving conversation that I'm getting to have with uh, all of the kind of work that I've always loved my whole life, with all of the artists' work who I admire, and then finding ways to also challenge myself and, and, and my own skills and interests. And I feel, <laughs> I feel very lucky mm -hmm. that that's the case. And when you ask the question about having uh, creative blocks, um, I, I just feel so grateful that that, if anything, I almost feel like I don't have enough time, mm. you know, to, to get into all the work that I want to. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, keep mining, brother. That's, that's, that's for real. Like, I, I don't want you to change. I, I, again, I think it's, it's all there. Um, over time and, and, and prior to um, social media, um, a lot of artists, uh, across all platforms um, tend to be somewhat um, influenced by politics. Do you ever find that politics of where we are today influence what you're doing um, in the studio? Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and it's interesting to me that question after we just did this activation, right? Mm -hmm. Because the activation is, of course, it's, it's the, the work that I've done that is most connected to contemporary concerns. You know, the name Eric Garner is uh, in that piece of work. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't lay claim to making that. It's Ross Gay's poem. Mm -hmm. um, but, that, but the activation seemed necessary for the time uh, for these times that we're in. Mm -hmm. And the first time that I activated that was in uh, 2020. So we're in the thick of the pandemic. This is after uh, the George Floyd murder, which I think for a lot of us brought, brought it all to a head as well. Um, that has been the only work that has been sort of, I think, outright addressing contemporary uh, politics head on. 
okay. in that way. Uh, but otherwise, uh, of course, the work dealing with blackness, maleness, the intersection of those things, that is, of course, uh, inherently uh, political, right? Mm -hmm. And that's always been in the work. Um, the work is now evolving as I've had this life-changing experience. I don't even know if we've discussed that part much, but uh, meeting my father's side of the family, yeah, yeah, getting yeah. back in touch with them. Get to that. Yeah, and that's, that's also political, but um, my, my concerns are always approach things from a personal lens. Okay. I'm always interested in the political through uh, my very personal point of view. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, in, and we spoke briefly about um, masculinity. So, when we started speaking about, um, I guess we should just get into that. Uh, 2020 FaceTime. FaceTime. Um, yeah. We you had a, you we saw had a, the piece carefully. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. believe that, that that was in my studio at the time. When yes. We FaceTime. Yes. Right? And yes. We, we talked a lot about we that, actually. in depth about it. In depth. Yes. And uh, you and your wife were both on that, at that call. I think she tapped out about an hour in. Yeah. And then we continued. <laughs> yeah, that's when I realized we was going to be boys for a long yeah, time. Yeah. I, I never got tired. I never get tired of talking <laughs> to you. We could just keep going and we kept going. And then, we, then we reached an impasse about Kanye and I was like, right. all right, man, I got to go. <laughs> I gotta go, man. I gotta go. I can't. I can't. You know. You bring it. All right, man. But um, but yeah. So you know uh, that piece, um, which I'm sure is is coming it's up back at there. some point, um, was was a very powerful piece, um, and you know you there it is right yeah, there, it is. and it's a huh. It's the work in the, the show in up, upstairs, so you can see that, that, that work there. Um, was, th was that the beginning of this series, or was there one, was, I think there may have been one more before it, or was this the beginning? This was a, a breakthrough in that body of work, for sure, Okay. and, and okay. largely because of the color. Okay. And the scale. I hadn't done one this small. Mm -hmm which felt very intimate. Mm -hmm. um, it was not the first hand holding a flower. Okay. I think I had done three, maybe four before it, mm -hmm. but it was the best when it happened. Right. If I'm being real. Yeah. 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 And I'm jealous that you had No, you said you, you said you wish you had Yeah. So to No. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but it's just that, um, <laughs> You know, I walked by it downstairs and, and I was like, wow, I missed that thing, you know, but um, I'm very glad that, that you and Katira own that. Yeah, you yeah. And, you know, I, you I, I let the people see it. That's right. I let the people that's see right. it, right? That's right. That's very generous. I, it's missing from my house. <laughs> so, you know. For, for a while now. For a while. <laughs> for a long, long run, unfortunately. But... Uh, we, we spoke about that. I made a promise to you that, you know, we would do it that way. Well, you, you back to that, that FaceTime, you connected, and Katira, the both yeah. of you connected with that work in a very real way. Yeah, it, it, was, it was a powerful piece for me. At, at the time, my, my wife and I were in therapy, and I was learning so much about her traumatic childhood. And in that moment, when I saw the piece, the, the first thing I did was uh, I saw us in this piece. I saw myself holding a very delicate flower mm -hmm. that I find extremely beautiful. But if, 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 I don't, if I don't hold that flower the right way. Careful. Yeah, it, it, is, <laughs> it is. It's a sensitive thing. It's, it's a very sensitive thing. And, and, you know, again, so many, so much trauma, so much issues that, that, that arise in each and every one of us come from our childhood. And, and for her, her, her childhood was extremely traumatic. And so 
you know, I'm still learning things about, about her childhood to this day. But I remember telling you specifically that this piece, you know, I was like, this is, this is the beauty and the frustration and the sensitivity mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, everything that represents m my particular marriage <laughs> and perhaps other marriages as well. But you, you understand that, you know, or relationships, you understand that this was something that really meant the world to me. And the title of it, it really helped me kind of process where we were at the time and, and it gave me a better outlook for where we were going mm. and where, where I had to, I think there was a part of me that always thought, you know, people, <laughs> I've learned over time in the last, especially in the last decade, that so many people grew up different than me. Mm. And people don't think like I do. Mm. So the expectation that somebody thinks the way that you do, you have to lose that mm. in order to really receive blessings, in order to really understand people, especially those you love, whether it's your children or someone else, <laughs> you just, right. you have to understand, you know, uh, there, that your way of thinking is not going to be theirs. And so with carefully, I, or carefully, um, which you exposed me to, because yeah, yeah. I was like, you was like, oh, carefully. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so it just, it all just resonated so, so much for me. And, you know, she, you know, even though she tapped out after about an hour, you know, she, she definitely was, she was, she was very emotional um, when the piece came. Yeah. And that was the first time she heard me talk about her in that way. Okay. And so she got emotional about that as well. And, you know, it, it, it all just kind of came together for us. And I will always be grateful to you for uh, not only the conversation, the work, uh, not only the work, but the conversation. Mm. Um, because it was, it was a turning point in a lot of ways. So. That's beautiful. If you can think of <laughs> art as a turning point, that piece did it. That piece really did it. Yeah. So you want to tell us about? Yeah. <laughs> Careful. That's that's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I think, Michael, a lot of what you're talking about is the way that we're challenged with unpacking our notions of masculinity sometimes in relationships where you're where you're forced to deconstruct some of the the toxicity, mm -hmm. right? And some of the things that we've carried over. Um, into, a, into what one wants to be uh, a loving, caring relationship. But um, it's beautiful to, to, to hear you describe it in that way as an effective tool for that. I often think about my works as affirmations uh, for myself, mm -hmm. and they're often titled that way. Uh, affirmation is a reminder uh, that, that you want to uh, implement and encourage to become more uh, natural, you mm -hmm. know, in your life, uh, and, and this piece was along those lines. It's sort of, a, I think, a, a reminder for me um, on how to, on the 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 function of care and nurturing um, in my life, and I've been thinking about how can we start to challenge our ideas of masculinity and include nurturing and uh, being careful uh, in that, like in the first line of the description of masculine, mm -hmm. can nurturing be there, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this, this was uh, as, as much a piece from my own personal life uh, as it sounds like it's been for yours, so I'm very grateful for that. There, there's a, you know, the, the yeah, beauty of this piece. Y'all don't have to clap piece. after that one. That's okay. That's okay. Michael, had, Michael said it right. 
the, the, the beauty of this piece is that, like I said, originally it was a, a turning point for me and my wife, but obviously, um, like in recent months, it's become somewhat um, of, a, of, a, of a piece that I've been looking at photos of uh -huh. because of the relationship I have with my son right now. And so when you start talking about masculinity, and you met, you met him. Yeah, so, you know what I'm saying? he's adorable. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and so, <laughs> so um, you know, it's, it's, it still holds, Yeah. right? It still holds in that way in that I've got to rethink how I'm going to raise him carefully mm. because of how I was raised and you know my father was a marine so what worked for me isn't going to work for him right right and so I'm I'm holding on to this and I'm using it again <laughs> as a road map yeah for the future yeah and how to take you know whatever um, tox toxins that I have <laughs> toxins is, is that the right word That's right from from my upbringing and not using them uh, moving forward with with him and you know and I'm sure once my daughter you know who just is the love of my life when she gets to a certain age I'll be just that that this this piece will always resonate mm. in my family it mm. just it just will and so I'm extremely grateful how did you um, your titles. Can we just run through the slideshow? Because we can, uh, the titles that this brother comes up with. And you didn't expect to see it on a billboard I later on. Dude, by the way. when 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 the piece got to the house, and then you were like, "Hey, check this out! It's on there billboards." It First, before we get to your titles, tell me how you got uh, connected with For Freedoms because that was such a great, great. It's a great organization. I don't know if you guys know about For Freedoms, but Absolutely. a great organization. Uh, for Freedoms, I got connected to through a friend, uh, artist Hank Willis Thomas, um, as I started to uh, do work with the Wide Awakes. Uh, the Wide Awakes uh, popped out during the pandemic uh, as a way to protest and also uh, have joy, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Hank Willis Thomas was kind of at the forefront of that. And then For Freedoms, which he established before Wide Awakes, but it sort of became... Um, closely associated, a lot of the same people were interacting. So Four, Four Freedoms did an amazing project with all these bill, billboards across America yeah. and invited me to, uh, to share a piece. So uh, I thought that that piece worked for the billboard along with uh, the text, which almost uh, became a sort of uh, call to arms. My mm -hmm. brother, how carefully can you hold a flower? Mm -hmm. I think in some ways became a way of provoking the question even further, mm -hmm. which uh, W which I found appropriate for for the uh, the platform of a billboard. It's a public uh, public place, right? Um, so yeah, we had to go there with it. So titles, diagram of an open. Yeah, now, that's tell, long. tell me about your titles because yeah. your titles are always like just they're insane. I don't know how you come up with them. Like so, it's just so I'll say I'll say. Um, Diagram of an open hand uh, and the law of attraction. For example, I do title a lot of the works, especially with hands, diagrams. Mm -hmm. That's why I also connected to what you said about the idea of it as a roadmap, mm -hmm. right? The, the, that the visual, pe the piece itself operates as a affirmation, as a roadmap, as a way of, um, as a way of seeing, as a way of be behaving, a way of thinking. Um, so sometimes I'm also calling, making a call back to woodblock printing uh, and other printmaking techniques like lithography uh, as uh, their history and illustration as diagrams, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of embedded in the, in the medium. And the use of this, this particular blue, mm. what, what, I remember you told me, what, co what color blue is this? It's not like a cobalt, is it? It's like a... 
Yeah, so th the blue is uh, lapis lazuli is what I'm referring to. Say so, that three times fast. And see, I know, I see heads nodding. So people know about the lapis lazuli, but <laughs> lapis, lapis lazuli was used by the ancient Egyptians. Um, and that was, of course, the first royal blue. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sort of hearkening back to uh, a kind of, you know, African lineage and, and connection to royalty. Uh, but of course, blue is, is, is also complicated in, in our uh, value system in society, right? You think about blue blood, true blue, uh, blue collar work, right? Blue lives matter. Okay, blue lives matter. So, there's, so there are so many ways of, you know, complicating the a value system mm -hmm. uh, with that color blue, mm -hmm. which I'm really intrigued about. And it also just operates and just uh, it vibrates that particular uh, ultramarine blue. It kind of vibrates. It sort of feels cool and warm at the same time. Um, so just, just viscerally, there's something about it that I connected to initially. When I feel that way about a color or anything, aesthetically, I feel a connection. I kind of take the responsibility to like do the research and understand the history that got it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you do, um, I don't know how you, do you call them the heads? Heads, yeah. <laughs> the heads. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen those works. They're just phenomenal. There's a beautiful one in, in, in my house. Uh, it's a light flex. Oh. <laughs> um, get you one if you can. Uh, get you one if you can. I mean, but, but those were the first ones that I saw. And I remember wanting to buy one of those first and <laughs> my wife was like no and I was like why <laughs> this is just tell me like where 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 the inspiration for all of that work came from because those those pieces always feel like a connection not only with the future but to the past what what are those about the heads mm -hmm. yeah and let me say first like I think that you're you're, you're such a astute like eye and collector to to but to to take the decision to um get the piece uh this piece the hand piece which it was not my sort of mainstay which is also exciting about this show elegies because a lot of the works in this show are, uh, I was joking with, with uh, the brilliant curator Monique Long about how it's, these are like the B-sides of a lot of uh, artists' practice, right? These are the things that they, that are sort of to the side of what they're known for. And the heads at that time, I think I was uh, producing a lot, was really into those. Yeah. And those are, a, for me, a shorthand way to talk about identity. Um, the head is the seat of consciousness. Uh, the face is obviously, you know, the, the, the initial way often that we interface with, with one another. Um, and I was also interested in the history of portraiture and uh, kind of, you know, challenging that around uh, images of black folks. Uh, so the heads were, and they were also monuments. They're about, um, what are the images of ourselves that we uh, construct with intent to be left behind for others to discover and draw assumptions from about who we are and the culture and the civilization that we are a part of. Mm -hmm. So the, the heads are often, and I, and I do call, I do refer to them as heads because mm -hmm. they're meant to feel um, as though they're objects because they sort of imply three dimensions and they apply a built space even though they're more or less flat 2D um, so they're they're meant to be sort of stand-ins for people in general and uh, the way we feel about ourselves is it safe to call them sculptures and, and I'm, I'm asking because when you look at them you can't help but see and I know you sculpt so it, yeah you know you can't help but see that I mean they're I think about them 
while I'm making them, I'm thinking like a sculptor. Okay. So I'm thinking about building space, even though I'm, I'm in two dimensions, I'm responding to illusionistic depth and space like a sculptor okay. does. Okay. Um, I don't call them sculptures myself, um, but I, I understand why they, they function that way as right. sculptures, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> the gardener, um, mm. when you first read the poem, mm. what struck you the most about Whenever I read a poem, there's always like a line yeah. that just, I'm like, ooh. Yeah. It just shakes me. Like, I don't know if you do the same thing, but if, let's say you did. I did. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. So it works. So yeah. what, what line like just kind of shook you? Um, so, oh, this is so beautiful because we all know the poem so well now. Um, There is, there's a few lines in there, um, but I think mainly what, what hit me, what woke me up in a way to that piece was uh, the line about Eric, and this happens early on in the poem, right? Eric Garner worked for Parks and Rec Horticultural Department. And to put that in context, that w I, I, I was smitten by that because I didn't hear that on the news. And it was interesting to me that I was educated through the facts of his life, the small needful fact, through an art, through a poem, um, which humanized Eric in a way that we had not received through any of the media. Um, we know through the media that he was selling uh, Lucy's, you know, that was their depiction, right? Selling Lucy's in Staten yeah. Island. Um, but now with the knowledge that Eric Garner, you know, put these plants in the soil, mm -hmm. um, I was just, I was just compelled to like, share that i wanted to circulate that as much as i could mm -hmm. it's it's beautiful it's um yeah yeah it's beautiful yeah it's, yeah it was intense the the poem i mean you know I, as an english major in college so just poetry always got to deconstruct it that's just my way my brain works under those circumstances and it's so interesting because um the term a needful fact, right? It, it, it makes you think it's so specific, it's a fact. We right. know facts are facts, that's right. what it is. We don't necessarily listen to facts much anymore, but we, <laughs> right. we, uh, we understand, most of us understand what facts are. And yet in the poem there's so much um, interpretation um, with the term likely, mm. likelihood, mm -hmm. perhaps, mm -hmm. you know. And you, when, you, when you see mm. all of that, yeah, like you keep reading that, it's like you understand that, you know, Mr. Gay did not necessarily know Eric Gardner. Right. So he's almost projecting. Right. Um, and it, 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 it just becomes almost, it, it's so lyrical and beautiful in that way because in that projection you also get what could have been if, he was still here, right? Like, if, like they're still, ah, yeah. That being said. Um, yeah, and, and yeah. if I can jump in and just add Please to that, do. I mean, the fact that, I, I, to me, the, the small needful fact in that poem is about our interconnectivity, right? Ross Gay is trying to alert us to the fact that Eric Garner uh, one of us has allowed, has helped us breathe, even while his breath was taken away. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're hit by the reality that we're all doing that. We're either helping each other breathe or we're disallowing it. Mm -hmm. 
that becomes very clear in that in that piece. Um, and to me, that that is the the small needful fact of the of that poem, right? Mm -hmm. Is like the delicacy, the, the uh, how delicate our ecosystem is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're all interconnected and implicated, and that our justice relies upon one another, right? Just like the air, right? Right. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? I think, I think I'm getting that part. Um, yes. I have a question about the fingertips. Oh, yeah. That's, that's awesome. Repeat the question. The question was, are those circles on the fingertips trees? <laughs> Tree rings. So I have to do what the, an artist does and evade answering that directly. Um, and the reason why is because if that's the experience that you're having with the piece, I welcome that, right? Um, and I'm aware of that while I'm making uh, that gesture in the, in the fingertips. Um, there's other things that I'm thinking about as well. Um, it, I think it's probably in this slideshow the most evident in that very recent piece, uh, Diagram of an Open Hand and the law of attraction because the fingertips are emphasized there as if they are sort of targets for generating something in that hand, in that palm's upward facing uh, emptiness or openness. Yeah, that's great. Next question, yes, brother, go ahead. I guess I'm kind of following with that and earlier you're talking about, uh, you know, the map making. Mm. And in what ways do you see like creation, like you know, of your, you know, of your art, and on the other side, you know, the sort of like interpretation of like the, the audience, the reader, mm. and see that as a form of like creating a ritual or like sigil making or like yeah, I just I'm just curious. Shall I repeat that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think the question was. Uh, how, how am I seeing my practice as map making and uh, sort of creating ritual? Right, creating ritual. Yeah. Um, right, so this kind of goes back to uh, what Michael and I were talking about uh, when you asked about titling, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my titles are sort of just descriptive in, in some way, right, of what you're looking at. So open hand and the law of attraction. Well, it gets a little slippery with and the law of attraction because I, I'm not sure how we depict that with a, with a, a visual diagram, right? Um, but what I'm trying to do is um, lead the viewer in using sort of uh, straightforward, casual, descriptive language, uh, which you find accompanying illustration often, right? But leaving it open enough for uh, interpretation. Because some, some of the, some of the, th the map making I do or diagramming, uh, while those sound like very objective practices, ways to nail down facts, uh, it's impossible, right, to, to uh, sort of draw one picture of the law of attraction, right? Uh, I, I did one image called a uh, diagram of how to hide in the wind, where there's a head and there's waves of wind surrounding the head. Um, so there's sort of an impossibility implied there 
and also sort of a casual directness about uh, how it's a guide towards that impossible thing. Do you know all of your titles? Like, like, like if you just saw it, you'd be like, oh, that's, yeah. Yeah, often. Wow. Often, okay. yes. Okay. Often, right away. Sometimes, no. And then what I do is I get a, a piece of blank paper and a Sharpie. It has to be a, a, a big, fat, black Sharpie and a blank piece of paper. And I just write down words. Okay. And then that page turns into four pages. And okay. then I start crossing words out and I find the title. Dope. That's the remedy. <laughs> I saw this hand up over here. I want to get her. Yeah, coffee, coffee ritual, yeah. Yeah, and I was about... With the popcorn, do the popcorn yeah. too? Yeah, yeah. yep. <laughs> um, but yeah, it made me think about grounding. And so many of your mm. pieces, it's very evident that you have a grounding practice. Mm. And I was wondering if Mm -hmm. I love that. I appreciate that. That question and that, that perspective about my work. Um, the work is very uh, personal and it has to be for me in order to be compelled to make it. So I kind of live in that, in that world of, uh, I think, of being sensitive. Um, <laughs> and that's just, that's just, I can't have it any other way. I have to make work that is, uh, that, that is uh, vulnerable, that's risky. Uh, right now, a lot of my work is about me reconnecting with family, and I did this, um, my first solo museum show, and, and I heard from people seeing the show that, wow, this must be difficult to be this vulnerable and to expose this much about your life and yourself, but the truth is, I find it difficult to not do that. That's, that's, that's the way I am. I, I kind of prefer to just stay in that lane. Um, but, but to stay grounded, um, hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure if I, if I consciously think about how to stay grounded because I think, I th I think, I'm, I think I'm very worldly also, if that makes sense. I'm certainly in this, in this space of like mining my own personal history and emotions and, and those things, but I'm also very comfortable not doing that. I'm cool with like, you want to talk about the weather? Let's talk about the weather for 5, 10, 15 minutes. I'm okay there, you know? I don't have to live in the deep end. Yeah, I didn't answer your question, but that's, I don't know. Let's do, let's do one more. You want to go ahead? I'm just wondering, because a lot of the art uh, touches all our senses, do you listen to music? And if you do, what kind of genre of music do you listen to when you're doing your art? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, she liked that question. <laughs> what, um, no, I listen to, I go through phases, but if I find a song that is working, I will put it on repeat. And I'll just listen to the same song while I'm working on a piece. Um, sometimes I find that, well, let me back up. The reason I do that is because um, I want to get into that, that zone space where I don't have to consider how I feel about uh, if it's lyrics in the song or breaks in the music, uh, but, but I can kind of go on autopilot and, and just be in the zone. Having said that, um, I'm a hip hop head. I love hip hop. But there are stages in my practice where if I listen to hip hop, it's so distracting because I'm so into it. <laughs> And I'm so into the lyricism and the lyrics that it pulls me away from finding my own lyrics. So I will, I will fall in love with a hip hop song, find the instrumental version, play that on repeat. What was the last song that you put on repeat? Yeah, it was the, um, it was, um, Lauren Hill's song on that on the the latest song on the soundtrack. What's it called? 
on the soundtrack of So Vague. <laughs> Nobody knows. I'm, I'm, I'm so wanting someone to help me out here, Goonies. <laughs> Nobody has. Yeah, the Queen and Slim, that song. Is it that song? She had it. That song is, I mean, it hits. And it's just a groove. Guardian of the Gates. Guarding the Gate, Guarding the Gate. I had that on repeat for two days. Two days, okay. And okay. after this discussion, I will put it back on. Put it back on. Thank you for the reminder. So let, let's, let's wrap this up, I guess, in conclusion. Um, what, what is, this is the, the best question that people always come up with at the end of something. What's next? Yeah, what's next is um, the, sh I ju just mentioned I did my first solo museum show, uh, Our Labor, which is uh, traveling to Sycamore Jenkins in the fall in New York. And I'm um, doing a show in Luxembourg at Zidun Basset in September. Uh, and then I'm going to chill out for a little bit. Um, and I'm going to kind of recharge the battery, do some research and development, think about new things, and play that Lauryn Hill song on repeat. <laughs> One more question. If there was anywhere else you could go in the world and you feel like, like, you feel like it's calling you, what place would that be? Mm. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, that place is Detroit. Um, because, is Detroit in here? Okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I, recently in reconnecting with my family that's in Detroit, um, I take any opportunity to get, to get back there and visit them. And uh, you know, the more I, I know about them, the more I know about the city and vice versa. That city has such a you know, rich uh, history for African Americans especially. Uh, my family migrated from Memphis to Detroit for work in the auto industry. Yeah. And, um, you know, like many black folks in that migration pattern, expanded the city by like sixfold in population and built that city with yeah. their labor. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, we're left out of the American dream afterwards. Right. Mm -hmm. Obviously. And so that that city is so uh, com complex. It's so black. It's so beautiful. It's like. Um, I mean, my family are just they the best people that I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. And I just take every opportunity to, to get closer to them and, and what made them who they are. Yeah. Good answer, good answer. Thank good you, answer. sir. Thank you. I'm going to turn this back over. Thank you. Are we still here? Okay. Just a little bit. Okay. Uh, thank you all so much. This was so beautiful to witness just two friends having a really amazing conversation. Can we make Hey, hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, south, south. Yes. Yeah. Right. Not, yeah. Not proper, but if you claim it, I'll, if you have it, you have it. We take it. We'll take it. <laughs> um, we are so fortunate to have such a beautiful community of MOAD members and lovers and supporters sitting here in this space. It's so beautiful to see all of you, all of y'all faces, even though we messed up. Um, and I know that you all really, really, really value um, this work, the work we're able to do to put these beautiful artists in conversations with each other, to keep these, the, wall, the, the walls filled with incredible art, and all of that is possible because of your support. Um, so we would like for you to, if you can, in any kind of capacity, uh, make sure that you can uh, make a donation. We have a box right outside of there. You need to put physical money in the box if y'all still carry cash. <laughs> or there's a QR code that you can scan. And downstairs, our visitor experience um, folks can help you out if you want to make a donation there. I was so quick to ask y'all for somebody that I did not introduce myself. <laughs> My name is Dayana. I'm a development associate here at MOAD. And we just hope that you all commit to supporting us and keep these things going around here. Yes? Yes. 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 Thank you, Dayana. All right. Thank you both.
both so much for an incredible conversation and incredible art. Thank you. And thank and you all. Can I say thank you one more time to everybody in that activation for helping out? Um, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. Yeah. Um, so I do want to introduce the incredible curator of the LG show, Monique Long. Yeah. The show is so beautiful, and we're so grateful to have it here at Moad. Um, it will be up through August 18th, and then it's traveling to Savannah, Georgia, to the Telfair Museum. So if you know people in the southeast area, please tell them to go to Savannah and um, check out the, the show there so as many people can see as possible. Yeah, just unfortunately, Michael just will not have that piece for several <laughs> <See>? months longer. <laughs> but you get to have it. He has plenty of art. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think. Rotate, so. yeah. <laughs> not, not that piece. Not that piece. Not that piece. Um, so thank you all for being here. And just a quick reminder about the survey QR code. Scan it with your phone. It'll pop up on your phone, and you can take a little survey. It's super helpful for us. Thank you for coming to Moa today, for enjoying um, the work that we do, and we hope to see you here again. Thank you. Uh, you